All right. So uh, we will start a little bit ahead of time. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Weiss. I work for Carrot Search, and uh, let me quickly quickly introduce myself. So um, I like coding, I like uh, cycling, I like uh, baking cheesecake, uh, but most of all, I like just to chill, which seems to be a family feature because my son somehow inherited it. We're doomed, man. Anyway, uh, today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the testing paradigm found in Lucene, Elasticsearch, and Solar, uh, which is based on randomizing uh, tests, randomizing how they execute. So uh, this talk is actually going to be shorter than I planned. I thought it would last like 40 minutes, and I only got 20. So we will have to fast forward a little bit some of the slides later on. Uh, but basically, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what randomized testing is and how we use it in uh, Lucene, what the foundations are. So um, the introduction, as a historical note, <laughs> which leads me to the conclusion of the introduction, uh, which is, you know... Uh, I was really serious about those 40 minutes. Uh, anyway, uh, so the unit test, like I said before, uh, you know, they, have, they serve three purposes. They increase the confidence in implementations. So if you wrote the unit test, you ran your software, uh, it passes, it increases your confidence in your test and your implementation. Obviously, there is a correlation, obviously, well, we think there is a correlation between the number of unit tests and the reliability in the software. Uh, and uh, most of all, it provides insurance against future changes. So if you change something in your code, then you have lots of unit tests covering a lot of you know, code execution paths. Um, you can kind of rely on future changes. If something in the future change, changes, either you change it or somebody else changes it, and uh, those tests still pass, you can be confident that the software is still OK. But there is, there is a big problem. Uh, namely, unit tests rely on assumptions. You, by writing unit tests, you typically embed your own assumptions about the world and the software. And uh, this really doesn't match what the real world offers. So for instance, if I give you this snippet of code, and uh, watch this, the hardware zoom. Uh, if I uh, show you this snippet of code, can you tell me, can you see it in the back? All right, can you tell me if this can ever ha fail? Like, wh what's the catch here? Okay, the catch is this function, this, this one, math apps. Like the absolute value of a number, of an integer. What's the catch? The catch is, Math apps can actually return a negative number, which many people wouldn't think possible, right? But if you pass it uh, min value, there is no positive counterpart of min value within the int range. So it just returns the min value. So apps is not returning a positive number. It returns the negative number. And this example can actually fail with an array index out of bounds exception, which, you know, is like, what? But it can happen. So, Generalizing this a bit, what you think about your code depicted here with this blue rectangle, and what you think about your assertions depicted here with the red you know, lines and circles, these are far off from what the real world is actually like. I mean, the, the test still passes. It just does things that you wouldn't think are actually happening, or it doesn't do things that you think it should be doing. So just to, you know, just to make a parallel to the real world, you, you ride a car and you listen to, song, listen to this song on the radio, and you have this heavenly you know, female voice, and you have this perceptual image of this girl singing it. But then it turns out it's the Eurovision, Eurovision winner, uh, <laughs> Conchita Wurst, which, you know, amazingly, it's just it's like an improbable event, you know? But, it, it all goes well with Murphy's Law. I mean, you know, if, if there is, if there is a, an improbable chance of something happening, it will eventually happen. It, it, it will eventually happen in your code at the wrong moment. So we will try to kind of face this problem and um, provide an answer for it with randomized testing. What is randomized testing? First of all, it is not a paradigm shift, OK? This is important because people are afraid of departing from what they know. So they know unit tests. They are afraid of 
departing from those familiarity zone. They are, you know, comfortable in their own of in their domain of unit tests, and they don't want to try anything else. It's not a paradigm shift. There are still unit tests. There are just a slightly different ones. Um, and another thing, randomized test. In randomized testing, it's not mutation-based. So there is no uncontrolled changes introduced to your software. You are in full control over what that randomized test will, act, will actually be doing. The only thing changing is that there is a seed of randomness and there is some you know, random choices of components of data. But you still are in control over what's being randomized, which is contrary to the PyTest, for instance. If you know the package PyTest, it's not what PyTest is doing. So what is randomizing, randomized testing about? What's the main points of it? Well, there are three. First, ideally, we would like our tests to run a different execution path on every execution. So every execution will run a different set of you know, code paths through your uh, program. This is done by either substituting components at runtime or substituting data, diversifying data fed to the program. How it's done, I'll show you in a bit. Um, the next thing is um, each run has to be deterministic. So it's randomized, but it's not random. It's pseudo-randomness. You know, if you start from the same initial seed of this randomness, every single execution is repeatable or should be repeatable you know, in an ideal case. And the third point is, since it's, a it's essentially a stochastic process, so every single execution will be different, and uh, you just need a lot of samples over the search space. So you need to run those builds continuously over and over on a build server. It's not just on commit, run the test. It's over and over again, because it increases your coverage. It increases the, you know, the, the, the coverage of the search space of those randomized parameters that you're going to put in your code. A valid question would be, why not just test everything? Like all the combinations of you know, inputs, all the combinations of components. And the answer is, it's typically just not possible. I mean, there's just so many of them that you know, the, the, the search space is so large that the, taste, the, the test would take forever to execute. So we're going to sample from this space and uh, run those tests at a fraction of the cost and still kind of ensure that they, they work. Maybe not on the first run, maybe not on the second, but eventually, you know, the worst thing, Conchita Burst, will happen. I mean, uh, something will happen. So, uh, um, now let, let's um, get down to the bottom of it. What can we randomize at the unit test level? Uh, and how can we assert, what can we, you know, what type of assertions can we add to our code that somehow verify whether the test actually executed in the right way if the inputs are randomized? So if the inputs are changing, how do we add assertions that are verifying that something went right or wrong? Um, let's first handle the, the first part. So the, the, the most obvious thing that we can randomize is uh, input data, iteration counts, and arguments. If you have a component that accepts a string, don't feed it just ASCII characters. You know? Don't feed it just ABC. Feed it a random Unicode sequence of characters that is valid, but not obvious. Uh, if you have a component that has in the contract that the methods can be called in arbitrary order, do call it in arbitrary order. You know? Randomize the, the, the sequence of method calls and let it run. I mean, you know, don't hard code just one particular sequence. Let it run randomly. If, you've, if you have other arguments that are possibly constrained, but from a range of values, randomize them, run the tests. Here we have some examples from Lucene, for instance, the iteration counts. Uh, you know, we, we pick them at random. If there is something that runs, that can run many times, we pick at random the number of times that it, you know, is invoked with and run it. The same thing goes with uh, parameters. You know, we pick somehow we pick random strings. Somehow we pick simple strings. Somehow we pick. Sometimes we pick longer strings. It all it's all within the con constraints and within contracts of a given component, but tries to search the whole space of possible possibilities. The next thing you can randomize is software components. An interface 
is a prime example of this. If you have an interface, there should be multiple implementations of that interface. Do substitute those implementations at test time, so that a test written for an interface is not just running against this one particular implementation, but is being fed with different configuration of you know, implementations of those interfaces. With one interface, this is pretty obvious, but if you have multiple interfaces in your program and multiple implementations in your program, the, again, the search space, the number of different configurations goes sky high. And then you, the only thing you can do is actually probe those random configurations of components. Lastly, uh, the environment. You know, the, this, is, this is the most obvious thing to randomize. Randomize locale, randomize uh, the time zone, the JVM itself. You know, sometimes the JVM is the source of a bug that you don't know of. Um, the operating system. If you're running on Windows, it will behave differently from other operating systems anywhere in the world. So, uh, exceptional triggers. Uh, you can also add some like bonus things like IO, like cause random I/O problems or network problems. But these are far advanced for this talk, so I'm not going to delve there. Uh, now, how to assert on those randomized, you know, inputs? What, how how do we build assertions? There are a few ways to do, to handle that. First, if you have a component, if you have a piece of software. Uh, and you have a number of different implementations. Again, either a naive implementation or a previous version of a component that is not optimized. Feed the same input to both of these and compare the outputs. You don't, know, you don't need to know what these outputs are. They just need to be identical. You know, if you have a sorting algorithm, feed it with the sequence of integers. It should be sorted in the output. Uh, the next thing you can do is sanity checks. So, what this boils down to is basically throw some shit on your software and wait for it to hit the fan. Basically, that's what it is. You know, you randomize the input, throw it at your program, and wait for an insertion to happen. If it happens, correct the bug. If it doesn't happen, fine. You know, nothing, nothing wasted. And lastly, you can do nothing. And this is the you know, the stronger version of the previous one, which is you, you don't assert on anything. You just wait for an unchecked exception for a JVM crash, which happens a lot in Lucene if you're tracking the <laughs> build logs. It's surprising how the world actually spins with all the JVM bugs that we discover notoriously. All right, so that was the theory, now the practice. Um, if you take a look at Lucene, uh, there are a number of quality assurance components, some of them divided between the static checks and the runtime checks. Static checks, Uwe will be talking about, so I'll skip these. Uh, and runtime checks, uh, we have a number of rules in Lucene test case that are really interesting. If, you're, if you haven't seen a really complex JUnit system, Lucene test case is the class to take a look at. There are um, rules for detecting static memory leaks, straight threads, temporary file cleanups, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of interesting things there. I just don't have the time to cover them all. The one I would like to focus on is randomized runner, which is our JUnit runner for running tests. So it's essentially something that runs, takes your JUnit tests and runs them. What were the goals for this package? First of all, compatibility. So if you know JUnit, you can run those randomized tests. There's nothing special about it. The only thing you need to do is to add one annotation. The second thing is it provides some helpers that you know, help you to organize this work with randomized testing. First of all, it picks the random seed, the initial random seed for every test. And the second thing is it provides you with that seed. Otherwise, you wouldn't know how to repeat a test in case of a failure. There's also other things that are part of the package that I won't be going into because it's a 20-minute talk. But if you're interested, catch me somewhere and I'll uh, gladly explain them to you. So, an example. An example. We have two classes here. I don't know if you can see them. Can you? OK. We have two classes here, um, six tests. The, the, what makes it run with the randomized runner is the annotation on top. It's the standard JUnit annotation run with, provided with the randomized runner class that uh, runs those tests in that randomized environment. And uh, what even this does is, you know, if you run it in Eclipse three times, every single time you run it, 
you'll notice that the order of tests, the order of test methods changes. So if you compare the first one to the second one to the third one, every execution is different. And what it depends on is it depends on this master seed that was picked by the framework at the beginning of the execution of the test. So this master seed here is different from this one, is different from this one. And what's important is if you pick the same master seed over and over, the execution, the order of those methods will remain the same. So it's predictable, it's pseudorandomness. It's not, you know, random, it's pseudorandom. But you get, you, 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 you get the control over which starting seed it starts from. Okay, so you would probably want to utilize this, this randomness somehow, since you're, you're about to write a random test. Um, this is how it's done. It can be done in a number of ways, you know, with um, those utility methods, so you don't have to know anything about the internals. Or you can explicitly call for uh, the randomized context, which is the context that provides you with those random generators, random number generators. And then you get a random, and then you just use that random. You know, you just pick whatever values or whatever inputs you want for your program and run your program with uh, those values. Here we have an example that asserts true on a random variable. What should this test do? Well, it should, te it should fail on every other run, right? So uh, if we run it in Eclipse, chances are it will run successfully, but from time to time it will fail. And now comes an important part of the framework. Because if a test fails, you need to know what the master seed was. Otherwise, you won't be able to repeat the same sequence of operations. And uh, what's cool about it is that any exception thrown from a unit test with the randomized runner you know, running above it will have this synthetic stack trace entry that contains the seed, which is here. So all you need to know is this seed and then repeat the test, and it should predictably run in the same way, and you should be able to figure out what was wrong. If your test never ends, which means, you know, it hung somewhere, it froze somewhere, you can still get the seed, because you can ping it, and you can dump all the stack traces, and one of the threads will have the seed in its name. So you can still get the seed, even though... Um, what does it say, Fabian? 15 minutes? I like you. So... Uh, all right, so now, once you've hit a failure, you have to face the bull. I mean, you have to face the bug. And sometimes the bug or the bull will turn your world upside down. Uh, but you do have a chance of reproducing it, right? You know the master seed. All you need to do is fix the master seed either with an annotation on top of a class or by passing a system property with the seed embedded in it. You can also repeat, the framework allows you to repeat a unit test a number of times. So if you run this, uh, take a look at the slide, it's the repetition of that single test 20 times over with different seeds starting from the one you've provided. So this, this seed is identical to what we've provided in the annotation. Every other one is different. They are split between the static context and instance context. I'm not going to go there. Uh, but every other execution is different. And you can see that you know, pretty much 50% of the test failed. This is a good information because it means that your test is failing sometimes and it's running sometimes. You know, it's, it's randomly failing. Now, if we fix both, both of those seeds, the instance level and the master seed, and rerun it again, see, the seeds are all constant. And now the test is always failing. And this is, again, an important information because it means that your test is failing predictably for that particular seed. If, it, if there were some successes here, that would mean you're screwed because your test is not really relying on the source of randomness from the framework. It's also relying on some other information that is outside, which means you know, it's, pretty, it's really random. It's unpredictable. So what are the downsides of randomizing tests? Uh, there are a number. Uh, first, sometimes it's really uh, hard to achieve reproducibility, especially with tests that rely on multiple threads that are, you know, have race conditions that are time-based or something like that. For these, it's going to be difficult. Uh, second, 
there may be some incompatible random component configurations which you'll have to ignore. And this happens notoriously in Lucene. Like some component configurations just last forever or doesn't work at all. And we just assumption ignore them. So we ignore them at runtime. And finally, those randomized tests are pretty hairy. Like, you know, you try to debug something that looks like this, and this is a random input for a test, like a parameter or something. Try to debug it. It's just sometimes it's, you know, it's difficult to take, to, to, to somehow capture the sanity in this randomized chaos that is randomized tests. Another example is the JVM bug. If you hit a JVM bug, uh, which again, we notoriously do, uh, reproducing that is a nightmare because the, the, you know, the assortment of components and the data involved is random. You didn't write it. It just generated itself. And this is like a, an inline, inline tree from a method that notoriously fails for us, and nobody knows how to fix it. Nobody. Not us, not JVM developers. You know, I rebooted myself a few times. Uh, that's what it was. All right, so to sum it up, uh, I hope those 20 minutes gave you um, some kind of flavor and uh, that you're interested in this topic and that you'll take a look at those randomized tests either in Lucene, Elasticsearch, or somewhere else. Uh, they allow you to explore the complex boundary conditions found in the software. And they're really, really neat. I mean, they, they found bugs that you know, nobody else thought were possible. What are the downsides? The failures, once you hit them, they're sometimes really difficult to debug or reproduce. Um, and the ugly parts are within the framework itself. So blame me, because I wrote most of it. Uh, there are some problems with repeating with the different master seed. And most of all, some people just hate it. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you get something that every, t every time you run it is uh, running differently. And some people don't like this kind of uncomfortable feeling that every test run is, I don't know, sorting methods in a different order or something like that. So uh, it's not for everyone, but if you're keen on trying, please do let me know how it went. Thanks, Fabian. <laughs> now he's going to say we don't have time for questions. He's not going to say anything. OK. Ah, great. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, as you might know, of course, we don't have time for questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, as David already said, if you have any questions, just grab them outside today. Are you here tomorrow? I'm here tomorrow and uh, all day today, yeah. So you have a lot of time. Just get him. Thanks. Thank you very much.